please for John Mason. Thank you, thank you. So, um, this being tales of wisdom, then I was thinking of uh, what, what could possibly tell that would be meeting that that lofty standard, and and I was thinking about how in all the best tales of wisdom, then obviously wisdom is a very hard one, um, and that made me think of the Squire of Kendi, who won it perhaps harder than most for me. We'll have to see, but. He was the squire of Hendy, a, a big man in Hendy, which is a, a small town um, on just over the border into South Wales from, from England. Um, and they say that at the time this story took place, then he was a wealthy man, and he was reasonably respected in the community, and, and he felt very, very, very proud of his position in that town, because had he not done all that anybody should expect a man of his station to do, he had dressed himself well and made his house wonderfully, splendidly decorated and, and, and designed. And, and he could be seen at church on a Sunday and, and at all the, the town fairs and festivals. And, and he was known to give out some of his money to the poor when, when they needed it. But the poor, the, the, the other people, everybody else who lived there, they would talk to each other about him and voices just about loud enough for him to hear. Mm. And they would talk about how he might be all very fine with his big house, but he only ever really gave about as little as he could get away with. And, and, and didn't he even only owe his money and his wealth and his splendor all to the fact that he'd married well? Had he not? They say that his wife I'd been a fairy from out of the hills, green and gold, and had brought with her all the riches that her people had bestowed upon them to start their lives together. And that was the only reason that the squire of Hendon could really pretend to any of this grandeur. The squire of Hendon heard them. He heard them talk. And their voices were always there, nagging at the back of his mind. Hadn't he done everything that he was supposed to? Maybe. Maybe the people were right. And anyway, his wife might once have been a fairy from out of the hills, but all the long years of marriage and familiarity seemed to have somehow taken the shine off her own. So it was, one day, that the squire of Hendy was riding off on the lanes through the hills, and his eyes were caught by a flash of green and gold among the oak trees and the bracken on the sides of the valleys. And a glimpse of long, waving golden hair disappearing off into the woods. And all that filled his mind was the thought that here, here, was such beauty and such succor that surely, surely would see an end to all the troubles that assailed him on every side. And so he chased after this new figure, this young lady, off away over the hillside through the bracken and under the branches of the oak trees and up, up, up over the rocks and always that figure was just out of sight. And he followed her up and over into the rocks and the bare ground above the forest. And he saw her running away off down the other side of the valley. And the faster she ran, the faster and the more desperately he felt that he must keep up with her. And he chased her and he chased her and he chased her still. And if he hadn't been chasing her, quite so passionately, then he might have realised that he was running through more familiar lanes and roads now and down through valleys and fields that he might have recognised and certainly up to the doors of a great splendid house that might have rung some bells but all he did was follow her through the door that she had crashed through and into the kitchen to see his wife turning round 
to face him and taking off that green and gold cloak that she'd been wearing and looking him hard in the eye. And he came to pieces then and he saw everything that he'd become and he fell to his knees in front of her and he begged forgiveness. She listened and she talked and after a long, hard evening, then she agreed to stay. And for the squire of Hendy, things got better for a time. And the house was happier and the marriage continued. And together they would go out among the people of the town. And he did all he could to do everything that he felt was expected of him. He gave some money away and he dressed very smartly and the house was always beautifully decorated and designed, but over time, things started to slide once more. And the shadow came back. And the house wasn't happy anymore. And he would be walking, stalking around the house as if no one else was there, but still he filled the room. And if any of the servants were to cross him in those moods, then they would feel the lash of his tongue or maybe even the back of his hand. And at night, if his wife reached for him, then he would shrug her off and turn away. But if he reached for her, and she did the same thing, then he would fly into a rage and stamp out of the room and all around the house shouting his heart out. It wasn't long before his wife left. And then the servants, every single last one. And the squire of Hendy found himself alone in his great empty house stalking the rooms by night, sat by the table till dawn. And then the people of Hendy began to talk about how there was a curse on the squire's land. For had you not heard that none of the crops would now grow, and every work that he put his mind to came to pieces, and all his efforts fell to ruin. And they said, they said that this curse must be down to a puka, a bogey, a hob thrust, some beast that could be heard on the hillsides at night, howling in the shadows of the moon. Some even saw it, a twisted, blackened, dark figure crashing through the undergrowth in the wind and the rain. And the squire, he heard these stories. And when he was alone in his house, sat at his table sometimes, and he could believe that he heard that howling, and he heard that crashing, and maybe he even saw that shape dancing across the hillside. And one night, he could bear the torment no more. And he found himself breaking through his door and rushing out onto the hillside himself, searching for that beast, looking for that foul creature that was the cause of all his ruin, that thing that had brought all this injustice upon his head. And when he found that creature silhouetted in darkness against the moonlight, then he threw himself upon it and he felt its hard, rock-like shoulders under his bare hands. And he felt its earthy strength as he yearned and wrestled and pulled and tugged. And the two of them fell down, down crashing through the undergrowth, down to the valley floor. And he felt fingers like twigs scratching at his arms and pushing him away. And he staggered back and the beast stood before him just as the clouds disappeared from the moon and a shaft of silver light fell across the beast's 
face and he found himself looking into his own visage. And he was terrified then. And he ran, he ran all the way back from the valley, through the fields, down the lanes, till he got to his own front door and he broke his way through and he slammed the door shut and he barred it and he went and cowered in the furthest corner as he heard the beast treading through the puddles and the gravel down the lane to the front door and beating at the door and shaking where it was barred and scratching at all the windows and the howling and the raging all that long night through and the squire of Hendy cowered there in his furthest corner of the kitchen just wishing, wishing please that it would all just go away. sound that somehow seemed to chime and echo within the howling of the beast outside. And it wasn't long before he realised that that sound was coming from somewhere deep inside him. Mm. He felt the hum, the vibrations, the voices. He thought that maybe he was starting to understand. He stood. And he started to walk forward. And every step felt as though he balanced on the edge of a precipice. But somehow he made it to the door. Placed his hand on the bar and lifted it and let the beast inside. And it walked. Blackened, twisted, torn. But as it came towards him, it too stood straighter. And that face that was his own looked him in the eye. Squire of Hendy stepped back to the table, offered it a seat, poured it a drink. Next morning, his wife came back, stood there in the kitchen, and he stood up to meet her. He looked her full in the face. He didn't say anything. He let her decide what happened next. Oh. <laughs>